Okay, um, it's 7.35, um, so I'm gonna put you guys all on uh, mute right now. And uh, I'm not gonna allow you to unmute yourself. <laughs> so with the exception of, uh, of course, of uh, Andy here, let me go ahead and unmute him. And uh, Roland, I'm gonna unmute you since uh, uh, you're the other uh, one that has the powers of the host. Okay, so yeah, 7.35, and uh, let's go ahead and get our uh, meeting started. Um, so uh, the way this is gonna work as far as uh, uh, participating in the meeting, uh, uh, it's like I said, we're gonna have two parts here. The first part is gonna be the uh, presentation by um, Andy, uh, Andy Grant. So he's just basically gonna give him, give you his quote, life story since he started. <laughs> Not quite my life story. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, just bear with me here. Uh, so his, uh, his life story of how, how, uh, how he started in the hobby and uh, how he's progressed. And um, so and then the second part, of course, is just like uh, the meeting at the restaurant will let anybody uh, share their uh, images uh, using uh, the share a screen uh, icon down at the bottom. So, um, okay, so here's the tricky part on my part as being the host. Um, you have two ways to um, um, ask a question here. Okay, because you guys are all muted, uh, what I'm gonna do is uh, when you wanna ask a question, I would like you to either type it in in the chat uh, in the chat window. If you don't know where the chat window is, you uh, look at the toolbar and you'll see an icon near the middle that says chat. Now I'll bring up the uh, chat window, the Zoom group chat window. Okay, so you can type in your question there and what I'll do is I'll relay that question to Andy. Okay, after that, um, or that's one way of doing it. The other way that you can do it is those who have used Zoom, you can use to manage, oh, that's what I have here, use the participants uh, window. And what you'll see is an icon down the bottom right. And um, it'll allow you to raise your hand. And when you do that, it'll put an icon with your hand up next to your name. And what I'll do, is I'll unmute you and I'll tell you that you're on the air and you can ask Andy a question, okay? So that's how we're gonna do it. Um, what is it? Uh, I guess, Andy, are you ready? Yeah, sure. Okay, take it away. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Or can you hear me okay at least? Uh, I don't know if they will because everybody's muted. But you can, I, right? I can hear you pretty well myself. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> okay. Hi, right, so uh, my name is Andy Grant. I've met some of you people uh, at the meetings. Um, I don't know everybody, but hopefully some of you know me. Um, and uh, I'm a beginner astrophotographer, and I was asked to sort of talk about how I got started and some of the pitfalls I encountered and that kind of thing to help out the newcomers that are just now starting themselves. Um, so a little bit of history. I won't do my whole life story, but uh, I'll tell a little bit about myself as far as uh, astronomy goes. Um, you know, I, I used to love looking at mead catalogs and nice pictures that people took and got published in there and stuff like that when I was in like middle school. Um, and in high school, I had another buddy who was similar to me in interest, and we ended up purchasing our first telescope together. I bought a little Tasco, it's like a three and a half inch reflector, little piece of crap, uh, no mount, just a little tabletop tripod. Um, but that was the first thing I ever saw Saturn's rings in, which was pretty cool, got me hooked. Um, but that's all I ever got to use besides uh, binoculars until late high school when we joined an astronomy club in our area. And I got to go out to, in, retro, what, in retrospect, was a very dark area. And I really wish I still had that access, but we got to go to the, um, use the club scope, which was like a 16 inch, uh, not a Schmidt cast grain, but a cast grain type. Didn't have a corrector in the front. It was something that they made. And uh, seeing Orion in that just blew me away. So I was kind of hooked, but um, wasn't ready to buy a bunch of stuff yet. Later on, I, I got out of college and bought my first real scope. And of course, like most people, I bought a Celestron 8 inch SCT and I intended to do photography with it. Um, I bought a really heavy duty wedge, bought a T adapter, 
and then right about the same time we had our first baby and uh, my hobby just took a nosedive and I didn't <laughs> do anything for many years. Um, so about two years ago, I decided to get back into the hobby and uh, joined the Raleigh Astronomy Club and I found out that there was an imaging subgroup and I joined that and started coming to those meetings um, to, to learn about what it takes to do photography, you know, thinking I was gonna use my Celestron um, to do that. But I uh, asked a lot of questions um, during the meetings and learned a lot of good stuff and realized that the right way to go would be a, a refractor, a small refractor. Um, and uh, from there, you know, started accumulating some equipment and software and that kind of stuff and uh, got started. So um, this is just a little uh, presentation. I'm not the best speaker of all, so just bear with me. Um, and hopefully this won't take too long. I'm just gonna flip through and show you a couple things. Um, so talk I'm gonna go over is uh, the equipment that I got um, and use, the software that I use, some of my problems that I've run into, um, and maybe some tips that should help a couple of beginners maybe. And then uh, I'll show you some sample images that I've taken. I've been in the club almost two years and I looked at my data for the first image I took. It was in August of, of uh, 18. So about a year and I don't know, uh, eight months ago is when I got my first image. Okay. Um, so the equipment I'm, I'm currently using is uh, I have a Stellar View 90 millimeter F7 uh, triplet. And on that, I have a, a Teleview, Teleview um, 0.8X field flattener and focal reducer. For uh, guiding, I have a 50 millimeter uh, finder scope that came with the imaging scope, it's just a finder scope. And the, the camera I use with that is a QHY. Um, little uh, camera, it looks like, it's about the size of an eyepiece, it fits in an eyepiece socket. Uh, the uh, camera I use is a ZWO ASI 1600. It's a mono camera. I'm using their filter wheel and their filters. So it's all ZWO for that. Um, the mount I have is a, a Sky Watcher, which is like a sister to uh, some of the Orion mounts. Uh, it's EQ6R Pro, which is like an Atlas. It's an Atlas class. Uh, my focusing is uh, I have a, a RoboFocus motor that I, I bought from Michael Fulbright used. Um, and my controller is an Arduino that runs some off open source software that uh, is, you know, basically is a DIY. Um, but Michael also helped me set up. And then my flat box is also DIY. So these are just some pictures of what I use. Um, scopes on the left, obviously. You can see I got a couple of LOSMD uh, D plates on top and bottom. And I just have uh, some clamps that are mounting my finder scope uh, as my guide scope. The finder scope came with a uh, diagonal, which you would use when you're actually using it for optical finder. Uh, I replaced that with um, a helical focuser that's straight through that does not rotate the camera as you focus. The original focuser would rotate the, the, uh, the camera as you focus, which isn't very good. Um, and then the scope itself is there. It's got, uh, it, came with a, it came with a feather touch focuser, which was one reason I got it. Um, and then the imaging frame there is all attached. And then that's a picture of my mount. Um, this is a picture of the uh, saddle. I replaced that. The original one's on the right, the new one's on the left, it's an ADM. Uh, and I just wanted to show this because I like the mount a lot, but the saddle plate's kind of a deficient in my opinion. I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen, but there's a little indentation in the middle of the saddle plate that basically the saddle plate only grips on two ends. It doesn't grip in the middle. And if I go back to my scope, you can see my plates are actually kind of short. So I don't really have a whole lot of movement for moving it forward and back with the old plate. It also would uh, lift the scope on the side where the knobs are as you tightened it. It, would, it wasn't very well machined, so it kind of lift it and rotate the whole assembly. So the imaging scope and the, the uh, guiding scope would sort of be tilted in relation to the mount, which just kind of bugged me for one thing, but uh, I wanted a, a more secure saddle, so I replaced that. Um, here's a picture of the other side that shows the, the focus motor. You can just see it's kind of uh, strapped on um, with a, a bracket that was 3D printed by Mike again. Um, all it does is keep the motor from rotating. It's attached to the shaft of the focuser. And then that's a picture of the uh, 
Arduino um, in a in a uh, 3D printed box um, with uh, you know all the things I've soldered on to, to get it connected. Uh, this is my light box or my flat box rather. I built it out of foam board and tape and some uh, some stuff called Translim that uh, David Keller gave me. It's basically uh, a sheet of stuff that diffuses the light, and I've got three pieces of that in there, um, so that at the top you see all these these four connectors. I have LEDs up there. The connector in the middle is my initial attempt at building it. That one connects to LEDs that go all the way around the box and ended up being extremely bright. Change the number of LEDs I have uh, lit depending on the filter I'm using. So when I'm using narrowband, I have them all lit. And when I'm doing RGB, I have a couple, only a couple of them lit. Um, but that's kind of fun to build. Okay, so that was my equipment. I, I figured I'd talk a little bit about why I got what I got. Um, when I first joined the club and started talking to the members and asking questions, you know, I knew I was gravitating toward a small refractor. Um, I was planning to get an 80 millimeter and uh, this 90 millimeter just happened to come up in an estate sale the club was having. And uh, it was a, a fluorite triplet with a, with a um, feather touch focuser on it. And it seemed like a pretty good deal. So I kind of uh, went ahead and grabbed it and so, you know, kind of short circuited my research and all the other scopes. Um, and then started getting the mountain stuff after that. Um, for guiding, um, the, oh, back to the scope, you know, I wanted a triplet just in case I ever wanted to do um, one shot uh, images because then I wouldn't have the uh, the blue fringing and stuff that goes along uh, like around stars and things like that. So uh, for guiding the the imaging or the rather the, the finder scope came with the main scope. So I just used what I had and went and found a, uh, you know, the QHY camera it seemed to have a high sensitivity, which was something I was looking for um, for a guide a guide camera and it was small and IP shaped, which made it easy to use with a finder scope. Um, if I had bought something that was dedicated, I would, might not have to get that form factor, but for me, it, it seemed to make sense to get an IP shaped um, guiding camera. Um, for the camera itself, I based that decision on um, the fact that I knew that most of my imaging would be done from my driveway. Um, I would be able to travel on occasion, but uh, most of the time, most of my time, my time is kind of limited. And so I know I wouldn't be traveling all the time to image. So I knew I was going to be doing it from my driveway. I live in Cary, so there's light pollution. I also live, uh, there's a street light right next to me, so it's kind of bright. Um, and then my main interest is in Nebula. So I decided to get a mono camera um, so that I could use narrow band filters. If my, you know, if my, primary interest was galaxies, I might have gone with the one shot because I'd be doing color all the time or, you know, something like that. But I decided to go with the mono camera. The uh, ASI 1600 was used by a lot of the members in the imaging uh, group. And so I knew if I had any questions, uh, how to set it up or driver problems, you know, how to process the data, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of expertise in the club I could, I could lean on since everybody, not everybody, since a lot of people had that same camera. Um, and then the filters and the filter wheel. I knew I wanted narrow band, and I also wanted the option to do RGB. I ended up getting a a bundle that ZWO sold as you know with the filter wheel, the filters, and the camera all in one unit. So that's how I ended up with all ZWO. Um, and the filters have been pretty good. I know there are better filters out there, but as a beginner, you know <laughs> anything narrow band is is fine with me. Uh, the mount uh, that was that was probably my um, the, the thing I spent the most time on as far as researching goes, I ended up choosing uh, Skywatcher over Orion because um, I've read that with Orion, if you need to get work done on them at a later date or you need parts for it, they will only sell to the original purchaser. Um, and since this is my first mount, if I later decided to sell it, the buyer of my mount might have a problem with that. And so I feel like it might be harder to sell on a Ryan mount than the Skywatcher. Um, but I chose the EQ6 
um, because it had a you know a stated 44 pound capacity, which probably means you know around 20 pounds of gear is is doable. And I think my current setup is about 16 pounds, and it handles it pretty well. Um, but I wanted to make sure I didn't get something too small. I mean, I'd love to have a lighter mount. It is the, the head itself is probably 40 pounds. Um, I'd like to have something lighter, more portable, but I didn't want to buy two mounts if I bought something smaller and it didn't work out and had to buy another thing bigger. So I just went a little bit bigger. Also gave me a little of um, you know, headroom in case I want to put a bigger scope on it. Uh, it was a uh, belt driven and uh, seemed to fit all the needs that I had. It could also be controlled by uh, EQ mod, which is uh, some software that re basically replaces the hand controller. I did look at smaller uh, mounts and I also looked at the uh, Lozman D mounts. Um, and, uh, you know, I aspired to an astrophysics, but a little out of my price range at the time. <laughs> so ultimately I settled on this because it was fairly large and reasonably priced and had a good reputation. Um, and I've been, I've been really happy with it so far. Um, the focus motor and the controller, uh, I went with those because, uh, you know, with, again, Michael Fulbright helped me with this. He, he had me over his house one day and said, you know, we can hook something up and, and, and autofocus, uh, make yourself autofocus pretty easily. And he actually showed me, you know, uh, in person, we, we attached, attached his motor to, um, to my scope and we ran it, you know, through, uh, the drivers with the laptop and just sort of demonstrated how it worked and how, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, he actually let me borrow his controller and let me borrow the motor for a little while so I could make sure I worked in the field. And, um, I was happy with that. He ended up selling me the motor itself and I ended up buying my own Arduino and uh, building my own box. Um, so uh, you can get a, a retail focuser for the other touch, but they're like 700 bucks. Um, so it saved me a good deal of money. Um, I probably spent maybe $150 on the motor and parts for this. Uh, and then the flat box, I don't even know if there are commercially available ones that you can just buy, but uh, it seemed like a very, uh, good thing to do on your own which is foam board so i also like to, to make things and tinker a little bit so um it, it wasn't to save money i just built the flat box because it was kind of fun uh fun to do all right uh yeah. software that i use Andy? yes yeah i just want to um just do this again because it looks like uh we have all the people in our meeting are going to be joining us so everybody right now except for uh i believe three people are uh unmuted so everybody else is muted right now. So if you have any questions for Andy, you can use the, uh, the chat icon to bring up the chat window and type in your question. I will relay it to him. If you look at the uh, manage, or <laughs> that's my uh, icon. If you look at the participants window and uh, look at the bottom right, there's a way to uh, raise your hand. It'll put up an icon next to your name and I will unmute you and you can ask a uh, question for Andy. So just uh, let everybody know once again, if they have any questions, take it away, Andy. Okay. All right. So the, the software that I'm using is, uh, I started out using Sequence Generator Pro. I've uh, since moved to Voyager, at least I've started using Voyager. Um, I use EQMod slash EQASCOM, which replaces the hand controller on my mount you know, and talks, lets the computer talk to the mount and control it. Um, don't know if I'm going to say this right, but Carte du Ciel or CDC is a planetarium software. Um, really just helps if you want to quickly slew somewhere, you can pick it on the map and slew your scope there and whatnot. But uh, use PhD2 for guiding, it's free. So a CDC and EQ ASCOM. Um, I use SharpCat Pro only for polar alignment, um, highly recommended. Um, plate Solve 2 for uh, plate solving, Pix Insight. Uh, for processing and Photoshop for processing. Um, and then why did I choose these? Sequence Generator Pro, um, a lot of people were using it, recommended it. Uh, so I went with it. It's kind of complex and got some quirks. Uh, I've since moved to Voyager. And the reason I'm doing that is because uh, I realize I'm not getting enough enough data. You know, I've, I've been in the club almost two years. I've probably been out on about 20 nights or maybe a maybe a dozen images, and I realized that to get more data, I'm going to have to start automating and leaving stuff running out overnight rather than sitting by my scope. And uh, Sequence Generator Pro had a couple of 
of times when it would just hang on downloading an image, which if that happened overnight would mean an, a wasted entire night. Uh, Voyager is um, so far very reliable. Um, Roland has been using it for years and never had really any problems with it. Michael tried it for a while and said it's it's reliable. Um, so I'm, I've, I've switched to Voyager simply because I want to be able to run things overnight while I sleep to get more data. Um, I am still I am still learning it though. Uh, EQ mod, EQ ASCOM. I I I use that because uh, it's basically it is a re software program that controls the motors in uh, Orion mounts, um, Skywatcher mounts, and uh, probably some others. Uh, I don't have to use my hand controller at all. I just hook a cable up to my computer, um, and the computer, uh, the EQ ASCOM stuff, it handles. Um, you know, when you sync the mount, it, it tracks all the sync points. It will slew the mount. It will handle meridian flips, um, all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, it's just, uh, it makes automating and, and doing computer control easy. Now, I, I have no idea how that works with other mounts. It may be just as easy, but I know that some setups require you to connect your computer to the hand controller on a mount. And then it, you know, basically tells the hand controller what to do and the hand controller tells the mount. Um, this just eliminates hand controller. Um, CDC, I just needed a base planetarium. It's free and it actually talks to, you know, EQ mod or your mounts through um, ASCOM. Uh, BHD2, again, that's the standard as far as guiding software goes. Uh, SharpCat Pro, use that for polar alignment. It's uh, awesome. <laughs> um, you know, if you have, if you have a, a view of the North Star, it's very simple, very quick. You can dial in, you know, dial in your polar alignment really quick. When I'm Imaging from my uh, front yard or from or areas that I don't see the North Star, I actually use PhD2 and do drift alignment, which takes me a little longer. Uh, but if you have access to the North Star, definitely get SharpCap Pro. It's like $15 a year. Um, Face Off 2, uh, just pick that because uh, that's what I was recommended and it works really well. Uh, Fix Insight, I bought that um, because it's you know, basically the gold standard as far as astrophotography processing goes. And in Photoshop, I actually already owned it. Um, I don't I don't think I would go out and buy Photoshop just to do astrophotography processing. Uh, if you're going to buy something, get pics in sight. And then there are, there are actually cheaper alternatives to Photoshop that can probably do most of what uh, you need um, if you, as far as like, um, Want to do something outside of Pix Insight, and in Pix Insight, you don't even really need that. There's there are cheaper alternatives to that as well. Um, so that's just why I got the equipment and software that I that I use. That's what went into my decision making processes. Um, so some just a couple of the things that I've struggled with going through the the process of learning is a uh, one is just getting everything to talk to each other. There's a whole bunch of drivers you have to install, a lot of applications you have to learn. Um, and, uh, you know, getting them all talking to each other and learning the menus and the processes and the procedures and all that, it's, it's a lot to take in. I'm still learning. Um, if I imaged every single night, you know, and I processed every single day, it wouldn't really take that long to be an expert in all of it. But when you image a couple of nights a month or every other month, you know, you come back and you forget what you've learned the last time. So it's, it's slowly sticking to my head, but uh, <laughs> that's one of the biggest things. There's just so many, so many things to kind of get talking to each other and, and learn. Um, focusing struggles. When I first started, I did not have a Bothnav mask, and I was just take a picture, focus, take a look at it, take another picture, focus again, and, you know, I'm walking back and forth to the scope, to the laptop, to the scope. Real pain in the butt. Never really got good focus that way. Um, Michael printed me up a uh, Botsnav mask, started using that. It helps a whole lot. Um, I still had a, a problem with that, though, is I, I probably imaged for about three or four different nights before I realized that I could zoom in on the image that was coming in from the uh, <laughs> of the Botsnav mask. So I would focus and think I was focused, but when I later looked at those images, they really weren't that focused until I started zooming in. 100% on the image and, and, and getting that uh, spike for the from the mask in the middle. Um, and then another thing I did is that I, one imaging night, I took about, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes of data 
with the bottom knob mask still on my scope. So <laughs> it's kind of uh, embarrassing, but you know, that's kind of some of the things you run into is you just, you make dumb mistakes like that. And I've, I've made several, um, you know, obviously learning all this new software acquisition process, I'm still learning. I mean, I've got, uh, I think I have a pretty decent handle on the uh, pre-processing part where I get down to the calibrated data. But after that, you know, I'm still learning stuff. It's slow going. Um, it's kind of complex because again, I don't do it every single day and I forget, forget things and I don't know what I don't know. So that's definitely um, something I'm working on. Uh, I struggle with choosing targets. Um, I don't, I don't know the sky that well, just by looking up and knowing where targets are. I don't really know uh, how big they are. Um, you know, I don't know what narrowband filters to use or if they're applicable. So picking targets, sometimes I just go, hey, you know, <laughs> Mike or David or somebody who's around, what should I image tonight, you know? Um, so that's something I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, and then reflections and spacing, I've had problems with those. I, I definitely have something going on when I take images of uh, bright stars. Uh, got some sort of reflection going on there. I haven't figured that out yet. Um, I also have a hard time dialing and spacing because when you when you finally have an imaging night, you really don't want to spend it all night trying to figure out exactly to the millimeter what your spacing is. But it's something I really need to do because I'm I'm not that happy with the stars in the in the corners of my images. Um, and I'm not even sure that the reducer I have is a good match for my scope. Um, but those are all things that I've run into. There's probably some I'm not mentioning, and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot that other people run into that I haven't. Uh, but it can be it can be a challenge, but it's part of the fun. Uh, okay, so some tips that I have if you're a beginner is come to the meetings and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, I did that, and it helped steer me away from trying to image with 2,000 millimeters on a small sensor. Uh, oh, that's one of the, another reason I mentioned, forgot to mention was I, I got the ZWO 1600 because the, the sensor is a, a micro four thirds. It's not huge, but it's, it's definitely sizable compared to like a, an ASI 120 or something like that. Um, helps you get more field of view. Um, but, uh, you know, had I not asked a lot of questions, I might not have figured that out. So yeah, definitely come to the meetings, definitely ask questions. There's a whole lot of experts in the club that are more than willing to help you out. They'll go out of their way to help you. Um, and so that helped me a lot. I would definitely recommend that. Um, practice setting up your gear inside. That's a, that's a big one. So, you know, leveling your tripod, uh, putting on your mount and balancing your scope, um, hook it all up to your computer, you know, uh, have it uh, slew somewhere, make sure it can slew, you know, make sure it looks like it's slewing where it's going to go. Have it track, you know, quote unquote track while you're inside the house over the meridian, make sure the flip occurs, you know, check your cable management, you know, doing all that kind of stuff inside. Now you can't do everything like actually take an image, but making sure the mount actually goes where it's supposed to go and is balanced and the software all talks to it and knows how to control it inside when it's cloudy is, is definitely, um, something to do. And you also get practice just setting it up and taking it down so that when you're actually out there and it's dark, that's a, you know, almost second nature. And you just, you sit at the computer and, and do your thing. Um, figure out cable management. When I first started, I had about, you know, <laughs> 20 cables. I'd, I'd grab, you know, I have a couple of USB cables in a bag and I'd, I'd pull a USB cable out and then I'd plug it in my computer and go figure out where to plug it in and which camera and I'd have a power cable and you know, another USB cable and just took forever to get all these things hooked up. And then I had this big mess of cables just dangling from my scope. And so I had to constantly watch it whenever it was moving and especially meridian flips to uh, make sure it wasn't going to snag on something. Um, I've, I've kind of done a much better job of that. Now I've got my cables bundled together. Um, I know exactly where they go. I have some bungee, uh, some bungee cords on my mount that I can, snug the cable up to the mount so that it's all nice and tidy and then you know when it, when a, I do a meridian flip or a slew I know they're not going to snag on anything uh, it also helps you set up quicker um, I would recommend going wide um, when you start out I if I had to do this all over again like my, my scope is a 90 millimeter f7 if I was to go back in time I would drop down to an 80 millimeter or maybe even a 70 millimeter f6 I would I definitely get a shorter focal length um, 
I like my scope a whole lot. It's, it's got good optics, but some targets just won't fit in the frame. And I would like to have more field of view. Um, and in fact, I'm actually considering buying a camera lens that's about 200 millimeter just to get a wider field of view. Um, but not only that, going wider will help. Uh, it'll probably translate to a lighter scope because it's smaller. It'll be easier to guide. You have the guiding requirements will be will be um, you know slacker. Be, you know, your mount have easier time guiding it. Um, there's a whole lot of benefits to going wide, and then your images will will be easier to uh, to get in the in the beginning if you have a wider field of view. It's uh, definitely definitely. I think that's probably the biggest thing. Is just start out wide, and then as you get better, then you can start going with a longer focal length and get really small galaxies and whatnot. Um, uh, get autofocus as fast as you can. You know, initially I was going back and forth between the laptop and the scope and manually doing it. And then even with the bot knob, that took a lot of time and just pain in the butt factor. Uh, with autofocus, you know, I, I tell the computer to do it every 30 minutes or every filter change, and I just don't worry about it now. It just focuses. Um, as the temperature drops throughout the night or goes up, if it does, you know, the, the focus is going to need to be adjusted, and you don't want to be having to do that manually. Um, so definitely get autofocus as quick as you can, even if you have to buy a a ten dollar motor and hook it up with a twenty dollar Arduino and something like that. Um, yeah, and yeah, final question. question. Yeah. Yeah, this is Chris Cole. Uh, so um, you, you say get an autofocus uh, just uh, just for my sake. Uh, when it when it's autofocusing, does it do this during an exposure or does it like wait in between or something like that? Do you have to program it like that? No, you you you. Uh, it'll take an image and then when it's time to focus, once an image is done, it'll then, depending on what you're using, it might focus in place. Voyager will actually go off and find a, a bright star. It'll slew the scope to a star. It'll focus on that star and then slew back to the target. Okay, so, so it focus. does pause during the imaging session. And yeah, so you, yeah, it focuses between images. Yep. Okay, very good. Okay. Um, finally, if you're, you know, capture raw data and save them um, forever. So if you have a if you're using an SLR, you know, be sure to figure out how to set it to capture the raw image or raw plus JPEG because uh, with the raw you'll get the full you basically get the data coming off the sensor and it might be 12 bits per pixel or 14 bits per pixel or you know, I don't know if, if some cameras today have 16 I'm not sure but you want all that dynamic range. I mean I remember reading somewhere that what we do is sort of like taking a picture of a black cat in a shadow at night and then trying to to you know, make that cat look pretty. Um, so you you only have a few bits really to work with, and if you if you do JPEG, it's just going to be you can have two or three levels, and that's it. So definitely save all your things in RAW format and save them forever. Because I'll show you in a minute one, one of my example images. Um, I went back and reprocessed something later using the exact same data, and I think I got a better picture. And so if you save all your raw data as you learn as you learn how to process, you can go back your favorite images and, and redo them and get something that probably makes makes you happier. Okay, so I just wanted to show you what I've done for cable management. This is just this is my box. So once I've got my tripod set up and got the scope on it and all that good stuff, I bring this box out and I drop it underneath my my tripod. And this is I take the lid off and then I got a bunch of cables. They're all bundled together. So one bundle uh, goes to my mount and hooks up power and goes into the hand controller port. Another bundle goes to my laptop, connects the, the power for the laptop and two USB ports. Uh, another bundle goes up to the scope and it has two USB cables for the, um, the imaging camera and the guiding camera. Uh, that DB9 goes to uh, the focus motor and then a power cable for the cooler on the camera. And then that little white one goes to this little white one here, if you can see my mouse, goes to the battery that basically powers it all. Um, having something like this where I can just drop it in and I've got, I, I can just grab a bundle. I know where it's going. I plug in three things. I grab the next bundle. I bungee them all together and I'm good to go. It's just I'm off the races. Um, inside the box, I have a USB hub and that little box on the right is the focus controller and then a power distribution thing uh, called a rig runner. So, you don't have to, I'm not saying do your cable management this way, but 
um, if you figure out a system for you that allows you to not think about it, you know, instead of trying to individually place 15 cables, do something that allows you to just quickly connect everything, get it organized. That way uh, you're not spending your whole night setting up. And at the end of the night, I just disconnect everything and throw it in the box so the lid on it. Uh, some sample images, and then we can wrap it up. Um, this is a picture of the Crescent Nebula. I put this here because this was my very first image. Um, I was in my front driveway, or my only driveway. I was in my front yard in the driveway. And uh, David Keller actually walked me through setting up SGP on the phone. <laughs> you know, click this, hit this drop down, make the setting. He actually basically walked me through getting set up and on target to image this when they're banned. So it's just another example of club members being willing to help. Um, so this was, uh, a, I think it was a dual band. I never, I forget which two filters I used, but uh, you know, captured the data that night. And then uh, Michael Fulbright actually came over to my house and helped me process it because I had no idea what to do with the data. Um, and so this is, this is just this is my first image and an example of how club members are uh, willing to help if you need it. Um, pretty happy with it. This is a uh, M33. Uh, I don't remember exactly when I took it. It was probably not too long after that that crescent nebula image. Um, I'm gonna, I put this one here because the next one is also M33, uh, and this is oh, it's upside down because I have a different reference image. But this is just an example of why you want to save your raw data. So. This is my first attempt at processing the data. After I learned a little bit, I went back and redid it. And while this is not perfect, I feel like it's an improvement over the previous image. And if I had not kept my raw data or if I didn't have raw, I would not have been able to do this, this second processing attempt. Um, and I'm definitely more pleased with this than the previous one. The previous one has this sort of green, I don't know how much y'all can tell on Zoom, but uh, this one has like a green tint across the whole thing. It's got a lot of problems with the, uh, gradients and stuff. And, you know, this one's a, a little more color balanced, a um, little more sharper on the galaxy and a little bit better background. Still problems with it, but you know what, in a year I might go back and take the same data and maybe even add some data to it and get an even better image. Um, this is a double cluster. I just threw this in here because I like the image. Um, don't really have anything to talk about other than uh, I liked it. Um, oops, there's a, uh, look at these. I uh, put this in here to sort of say, okay, I like the image, but it's demonstrating some of the problems I'm having. If you look in the upper right, I've got this big rainbow looking burst of light. Um, and then if you look at the brighter stars in Pleiades, you can see these little patterns around it that is due to, I believe, the ASI 1600 not having an anti-reflective coating or uh, something else to do with that sensor because it seems to be common with that sensor. But this is some of the problems that, I'm running into is if I'm taking an image of a bright star, I see some certain artifacts that I need to figure out. I can probably fix the burst in the upper right. The other things with around the bright stars with the little pattern there might have to do some some painting <laughs> or figure something out there. But uh, even though I'm very happy with this image, there are definitely problems with it. Um, again, an example of the starburst pattern, the reflection of it's probably something with all the tech but it's in a different area. So something's going on there I gotta figure out, but that's another another example of um, some problems that I can have. And if you look at the bright stars again, you can see that weird pattern, but I'm still happy with it. I, I've always wanted to image a uh, horse head and um, I got it and I like it. And then Orion Nebula, of course, everybody's, not everybody's, but a lot of people's uh, take, take pictures of this. Um, you can see I've blown out the core, like most people, but I'm, I'm actually kind of happy with this. I got a good framing, I think, of it, and uh, I can actually see some of the, the darker parts of it in the, you know, the borders of the image, so it's not just the bright part of the nebula. At some point, I do want to uh, take some shorter exposures and um, try to get that blown out core a little more resolved and combine it with this one. Um, hey, uh, Andy, we got a question from uh, Mark Gibson. I'm going to okay. unmute him if I can get to work. All right. Uh, thank you. You're on there. How do you 
do your alignment or your image. In other words, you made a comment about how you are satisfied with your, I forgot what word you used, but the framing. yeah, yeah, the framing. How do you, I have trouble with framing. How do you, any suggestions on correcting? Yeah, that's, your, that's a good point. And I probably should have mentioned that in the software that I use because I, I just didn't think of it. Um, there's a thing called Aladdin uh, that you can download and you basically put in information about your scope and your camera, and it will overlay a field of view rectangle onto an onto an all sky. Uh, what's we're looking for? Basically, it's a it's a you know it, all sky survey. It has an all sky survey. It has all the images from that. It can, it can pull them down from the internet. And so you say, I want to look at I want to take an image of Orion. You go to Orion in Aladdin. And then you can overlay this rectangle that represents your imaging train. And you can rotate that rectangle and move it to where you want. Uh, and then it will tell you the rotation and it will tell you the right ascension and declination. And then what I usually do is um, take a screenshot of that information and put it on my imaging laptop. So then when I go set up, I know exactly the right ascension and declination I want to do. And if, if there's a rotation, I'll have to um, do plate solving see what the rotation is, rotate my camera, do another plate solve until I get the rotation set. And then you'll have, uh, you'll have your, um, your framing the way you want it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Uh, I think this is the last image I got. This is one of my favorite images, but I wanted to show it because uh, my field of view is not as big as I would like to be. So <laughs> as you can see at the top, you know, there's, there's still more image to be seen up there. And uh, I'm just, Rosette barely fits in my field of view, even though I have a micro four thirds sensor. You know, it's kind of, um, I never really uh, knew how big things were in the sky and they are, some of them are tremendous. Uh, so this is just an example of, of why I'm saying to go, another reason to go wide when you first start. Because if you want to take a picture of, of the Rosette and you have something narrower than this, you're probably going to have to do mosaics, which I have not done yet, but you know, I would rather just, image the whole thing in one shot instead of having to do a mosaic unless it's truly big um and uh i want to do something that even a, a low a low focal length uh train would need a mosaic with i know like steven christen's done some some really phenomenal stuff with the 200 millimeter canon lens and so um yeah this is anyway this is one of my favorite images and uh but it does demonstrate that i would love to have a wider field of view do you have any thoughts in mind of what kind of uh, equipment that you may get to get a wider field of view? I, I'm looking at I'm looking at the same Canon 200 millimeter that that uh, that Steve uses. Um, I'm, I'm also even eyeing. I need to actually load up a lad and see how big a field of view is. They also have a 135 millimeter that I'm considering. I haven't picked either one of them yet, but uh, the 200 millimeter is definitely high on my list. Very high because. My focal length right now with with my reducer is 475. Um, if I had like a 350, 200 might be kind of close to that, but I'm, I'm pretty far above that. Okay, very good. And uh, this is uh, the jellyfish uh, IC443, I believe. Um, it's the most recent image I've, I've uh, taken that's been processed. I have a, a couple more images I've taken I don't know, maybe two months ago that I haven't actually processed yet. But uh, this is just my most recent um, processed image. Uh, it's a, I don't know, pretty nice, I think. I, I believe it was a, I believe, I can't remember. I can't remember if it was two narrow bands or three. I had to look at the data. Uh, and uh, that's it. Does anybody have any other questions? Well, uh, I'll put uh, some comments up here. Didn't get any questions in the uh, chat window, but uh, Dave Keller has a little comical comment here. Uh, uh, for everyone, if you're wondering what that actual reflection was back on the Horsehead Nebula, that's actually the Enterpriser, Enterprise's transporter beam. <laughs> okay, another comment, comment from Mike Littleton here. Uh, so he says that uh, if you were looking for a good source for selection of imaging targets, a uh, place you can look uh, is uh, the 100 best astrophot astrophotography uh, targets by uh, Ruben Kier or Kier. I think I'm getting that right. Uh, okay. It's uh, from here from uh, the Patrick Moore's uh, Practical Astronomy series. And so, and final comment: 
uh, Ditch Q, uh, I don't know who, exactly who that is, so I apologize. Uh, just wants to congratulate you. Yeah, these are some pretty good images and uh, we can see how you've progressed quite a bit from that first image, uh, narrowband, which is kind of uh, extraordinary or uh, admirable because uh, most of us don't get started with narrowband. Uh, at least I did, definitely. But, uh, Thank you. but anyway, okay. Uh, so I guess everybody, if you wish to ask your questions, uh, you can either raise your hand on the participants for window. It's uh, an option that's on the bottom right, or uh, you can uh, type up um, a uh, question right here in the uh, chat window as well. So I'll give you, uh, let's say, I'll give you a minute uh, if you have, uh, you want to cue uh, uh, some questions here for us. So anyway, let's just pause for a second. Okay, Andy, uh, we got a question here from um, uh, Mark Gibson. I'm going to put him on. I'm going to unmute him. Okay. Mark, you're on the air. Yeah, I haven't graduated to using my PC with my camera yet. Is that a complicated process? I've just used my camera and the telescope. I've never married it to the computer. So is that an easy process to describe? Uh, well, that was that's one of the things that I kind of struggled with at the beginning because there is a lot of software that you have to get hooked up um, talking to each other. But again, there's a lot of members in the club that are willing to help with that. It's not terrible once you've done it, um, and especially if you just sort of connect one thing at a time. So, like maybe you get your software talking to the mount, practice your slewing. Once you're sort of comfortable with that, then you might add PhD two and, and start guiding. After that, you might you know, add SharpCap Pro and start practicing your polar alignment um, instead of trying to throw it all in at once. Um, but it it's uh, it can be complicated, especially if you have a problem um, with technical stuff on computers. But it's not terrible. It, it definitely is a little bit of a learning curve, though. Thank you. Yes. All right. So uh, we got a question from Jim P. Uh, I don't want to pronounce the rest of his name because I don't want to. <laughs> insult him, I guess. Uh, so it's over in the chat uh, chat window. Uh, let's see, actually, I'll, yeah, I'll go ahead and put him on. Uh, let's see. Okay, so Jim P, uh, I guess you can school me on how to pronounce your name. Uh, I'm gonna unmute you. Let's see. Jim P, you're on the air. It's Perchicante. You gotta sit with the Italian accent, Perchicante. Very good. <laughs> or just the American version of Perch County. Um, yeah, so uh, great job, Vanny. That was very helpful um, and uh, amazing work uh, early on there. Um, so my question was, if you're doing it all over again, you mentioned going wider. Is mm -hmm. there anything else you would do differently? Um, I might have started with uh, maybe not jumping straight into Pix Insight. It has a, it's a expensive and it's a little bit of a funky UI to learn. Um, when I when you first start out, you could probably do most of that stuff especially the basic processing with free tools and or, um, you know, much cheaper uh, uh, processing software. Um, I, I still would have eventually gotten Pix Insight anyway, but as a beginner, uh, if you're not sure you're going to stick with it, um, you know, it's probably, I probably would recommend going with something less expensive as far as the processing software goes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Andy, we've got some more comments here. Uh, so first, Rob Rohr, uh, uh, congratulations on having some good pictures there. And uh, uh, then also uh, Mike Littleton also uh, wants to thank you for the advice to do one thing at a time. And yeah, don't want to uh, get too flustered on uh, what targets that you want to add to or whatever, you know, that's still um, a habit uh, I'm trying to get out of. 
off. But uh, anyway, so I'm looking here. I don't see want to get everything going at once, and you just throw it all together, and then it doesn't work. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's how I wasted a lot of hours. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I don't know. Maybe I should shouldn't be as shy and ask uh, questions more so because you know I don't know. People are just so self conscious about their pride or or uh, whatever. Uh, but but anyway. Uh, Okay, uh, we did have one question that I didn't get to because it came from David Keller. He's a nice guy, but uh, uh, he was just asking how you got uh, uh, that nice uh, uh, background that you have there well, where you're like flying through space. So what's your current location? I'm just kidding. You can just yeah. tell them how you did it. On the planet Uru. Um, well, uh, Zoom will actually let you replace your background uh if you want and i use a, another thing that's made for gaming it's called x split vcam it actually is just a simulated green screen it will actually replace your background just like zoom will um and i just picked a space appropriate background okay but yeah zoom will do it if you know you don't have to have a separate program for that okay so um Let's see, uh, I don't see any other people raising their hands for questions for you. So what I would like for everybody to do is if you have, um, if you're pretty fluent with Zoom, uh, you'll see that there's an option. Go ahead and share your screen, I guess. Yep. Uh, so if you're familiar with uh, uh, Zoom, uh, we'll go ahead and let people share their screens uh, so that we could, well, share your images. So um, put a um, put your hand up next to your name, or um, go ahead and type in a text message if you have any uh, uh, images you uh, would like to show. So uh, while I'm waiting on that, I guess I'll go first with this. And I know Steve Christensen said he was going to want to uh, show show off some of his stuff. Um, let's see, let me get my share screen up here. So you're going to relay this all for me, uh, Andy. Okay, so uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen here. So let me go over here. So I got my folder for uh, Shark Caps uh, images. Uh, so uh, one of the images that I sort of finished already was the Flame Nebula. And uh, you mentioned, Andy, how you probably were wanting a, um, a 200, or excuse me, a, a, a shorter focal length lens to take images of the objects uh, that you. Uh, uh, that you're taking in uh, out, well, in space. <laughs> because some of these objects, yet light years away, are really freaking huge. Uh, it takes uh, either a really big camera, short focal length, and whatnot to really get these images to fit, or these objects to fit in your field of view. So um, here's uh, uh, an example of uh, the uh, flame nebula. So I'm just going to go through. Okay, can everybody see that, I hope? Just say, uh, tell me, Andy, can you at least see that? Okay, very good. All right, so uh, what is it? Uh, so yeah, this is uh, the Flame Nebula. Get this thing off my screen. This is the Flame Nebula. And uh, what is it? Uh, uh, this is in uh, Hydrogen Alpha. This is approximately four hours of uh, time that was put into it. Uh, so I did, I did, uh, took a, uh, uh, so this is that H alpha or hydrogen alpha narrowband filter. Then I went moved on to uh, the uh, oxygen filter, which is let's see. Let's see. I'm go ahead and close that if I can. <laughs> All right, never mind. We'll just have to do this uh, on the fly there. Okay, and then I moved on to uh, oxygen uh, three, which is uh, uh, this guy right here. So there's not as much oxygen in this uh, image. You can see it uh, right here in the uh, flaming star area. So this is the flaming star in a tadpole area, and there was some nebulosity over here. That's probably some NGC name. Uh, but down here is the tadpole nebula, but the tadpole nebula has quite a bit of uh, oxygen in it. So I uh, did a bicolor image, which gives sort of a representation of what it would look like if your eyes were actually sensitive enough to uh, see the uh, nebula. But this is only two channels, so we need to make a third channel. So hydrogen alpha, the first image that you saw, uh, was uh, the red channel. The oxygen uh, uh, image uh, um, that you just saw uh, was uh, the blue channel. And so to make a 
the uh, green channel for RGB to finally make your uh, full color image, uh, I took 25% uh, of uh, hydrogen alpha and then 75% uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of oxygen. And the way I did that is I just took the hydrogen alpha image and I overlaid the oxygen image on top of it as a layer in Photoshop and uh, brought down into opacity to uh, 75. So hydrogen alpha was a new layer, laid it on top, brought its opacity down to uh, 75. Combined layers, and this is my, uh, my green channel. So buy all the channels, do some processing, of course, and uh, um, this is the uh, final image right here. Looks pretty good, um, at least uh, I'm happy with it for right now. Uh, I wish I had, move the image a little further this way uh, because it's kind of chopped off right here. In fact, uh, I, I cropped out some of uh, a nebula, a bright nebula that's like on the uh, left side of this image right here. But overall, uh, uh, I think I'm pretty much done with this. Maybe I'll go back and actually put in some DSLR data of the actual colors of the stars there and just replace the stars in this image with uh, true color stars because that's the whole point just to make it look like what you could actually see with a one-shot color. So um, anyway, um, close that. Uh, finally, this is the image I posted uh, uh, early, I think it was this week or uh, late last week. Um, so I'm working on a, uh, an area of the sky and uh, started using a, a lens I had not used before. So like Andy said, this, uh, uh, some of these optics are huge. So saw Andy's last uh, image right here. It was under Rosette and he used, uh, uh, just put, give me a thumbs up if I got this right, uh, Andy. He used uh, uh, his 90 millimeter F7 reduced down to F5.6 with a 0.8 focal reducer and you saw how, thank you Andy, <laughs> you saw how uh, much of the field of view that took up. So uh, I can't really measure it right now, but uh, uh, down here, if you look, uh, not at this trail, I'll get to what that trail is uh, later, but you can see there's uh, a little bit of nebulosity in this area too. And that's actually the uh, cone nebula down here. And uh, I guess the Christmas tree star cluster around it. And uh, when I eventually finish this uh, image, uh, I'm trying to do all three channels. I'm almost done with uh, oxygen, then I'll move on to sulfur. This thing is getting very low on the sky, uh, very low on the horizon now because it's mostly a wintertime object. So I'm um, getting to a point where I only have about an hour and a half before it gets too low uh, to, uh, to image this area. But uh, getting back to what Andy was saying as far as these objects being huge, he was only able to fit this much in his telescope, and that was at 500 millimeters. This right here, I used an 85 millimeter Canon lens. Uh, I know it's uh, it's uh, the original, uh, I guess, native uh, f stop of that is uh, f 1.8, and um, an f 1.8. Uh, what is it? Uh, you get or you get some really crazy wonkiness happening at the edges. So I stopped it down to f 4. Uh, but in total, I uh, just basically looking at some uh, uh, field of view calculators online and whatnot, what you're seeing here is uh, nine degrees wide by six degrees uh, tall. So it's a huge field of view for, uh, and makes sense because it's 85 millimeters or a little less than, uh, or a little more than 20% uh, of what Andy was doing there with uh, his uh, refractor to uh, bring in the uh, Rosette Nebula there. Um, but finally, yeah, you're like, well, wh what in the world is that streak? So if you didn't read my email, uh, what happened that night? And I knew it was going to be up. Uh, the International Space Station was making a pass over our area. And, well, lo and behold, it passed, it photobombed uh, this uh, exposure right here. So, you know, I thought that was neat. Uh, I never had, uh, I hate it when satellites or airplanes photobomb, but, you know, ISS, uh, don't get that very much. So uh, I'll let it slide, per se, because, uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, it's ISS. Uh, usually, well, we actually, a lot of us imagers actually go out to actually look at the ISS, uh, do a trail of it, or uh, if we're really ambitious, try to uh, get a, a snapshot of it. Uh, usually a good snapshot of it, the best way to do that is when it's uh, going over the sun and you can use a solar filter to capture the silhouette of the uh, ISS going across it or getting it when it crosses the moon. I did that, it was my first attempt, it didn't turn out very well, but you know, whatever. So 
Anyway, uh, that's all I have to show. And I got a comment from Rob Orr. I thank you. He likes my flame nebula image that I just sh showed. And uh, anyway, okay, I'm done there. Let me close my stuff. Close you. Okay, I'll stop my share here. I'll bring you back and uh, let's see. Okay, so I don't have any questions or anybody who's wanting to present images in the uh, group chat window. I'm going up and down. I don't see anybody who's raised their hand. So again, if you want to present an image, uh, uh, put into the uh, group chat window uh, that you want to present an image and or raise your hand over here to the participants window. However, I do know Steve uh, Christensen wants to show off uh, some images. Uh, let's see if I can find, yeah, there he is. And he has raised his hand, so thank you. All right, take it away, Steve. Uh, I can see you, but I don't see uh, uh, an image right now. Yeah, it usually, what happens is, and that happened to me just now, well, actually uh, the other previous times I used Zoom, uh, it'll give you a choice of which window you wanna show off. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I'm still a beginner at all this, so uh, the best way I can tell you is uh, to open up uh, whichever uh, directory you have uh, these images in on your actual, oh, it's on a web page. Oh. Okay, uh, well, let me get that on the screen. Yes, that worked. We can see it. Yeah, I checked to actually see if I checked that, and that was uh, my uh, uh, the exact same night. Mine, the uh, uh, state. Yeah.
Okay, uh, so let's see if anybody doesn't have anything else. Uh, um, again, I'll give you a few minutes to uh, raise your hand in the participants window, or if you want, to, uh, you can uh, uh, post a request on the Zoom group, and I'll put you on to share some images. But uh, um, before I uh, uh, before we close, uh, just uh, just a really quick thing uh, that David Keller brought up because we uh, were on the subject of a blog of that long, uh, short focal lengths uh, uh, pictures uh, when I was comparing the uh, Rose Nebula, Rosette Nebula image of uh, the one that Andy showed at the end of his presentation, nice uh, full color uh, narrow band image. Uh, you probably saw how, uh, how that fit give yourself candy it looks pretty good it, was, it framed pretty well uh, but uh, uh, and then uh, I used an 85 millimeter Canon lens and uh, but if you're looking for just like a simple uh, telescope uh, setup one thing David Keller uh, suggested was um, to um, look into the Williams optics uh, telescope called red cat and uh, yeah it has a pretty wide field of view I want to say uh, here, hold on. Uh, Andy, I'm going to, oh, excuse me, uh, Dave, um, if you'll allow me, I'll put you on. So I try to unmute you, but okay, there you go. Dave, could you like talk about this? Can you hear me, David? Okay. All right, yeah, I don't know if he's uh, getting me right now, but uh, anyway, so yeah, it's by Williams Optics. It's called the Red Cat. It's a nice uh, tel small telescope, and um, what is it? It's worth looking into. In fact, I, I, probably, I just saw the other day. It come, they call it Red Cat. Um, I don't know what the cat stands for because it's not like a Catadia Optric or anything like that. Um, I don't know how big it is. Uh, I know it's, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere below 70 millimeters. I want to say it's 50. Uh, but the uh, uh, red cat, it's red in color, then we stopped uh, uh, OTA is, and uh, the, uh, uh, well, actually, Williams Optics actually came out with a quick special edition. The only thing I can tell about it is that it's, uh, it's got a blue tube instead of a red tube. <laughs> but Paul Alakis, uh, let's see, he just uh, uh, put down here in the chat window, the, uh, looks like the uh, URL, of the, the uh, red cat if you want to look at it from uh, the opcore uh, uh, website so you can take a look at that if you wish uh, let's see so if uh, you look uh, I don't see anybody else here uh, raising their hand I don't see any uh, what do you call it uh, yeah I don't see anybody in the chat window uh, that are asking questions. Let me go back over this. Yeah, I don't see anything here. Okay, well, um, I guess that's the end of the meeting, unless uh, anybody else uh, has anything uh, uh, to uh, uh, talk about. Uh, Barney just brought up as a quick note that Red Cat is 250 millimeters, so that's pretty close to what uh, the uh, my, uh, Canon 200 millimeter lens is back when you saw that uh, plain nebula and tadpole nebula image. Uh, uh, that was taken with a 200 millimeter uh, Canon lens, and uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that the Canon lens is way pricier than the 250 millimeter uh, uh, Red Cat. So uh, I guess the Red Cat's a good alternative if you want to get something very wide uh, or get some very wide uh, images of the sky. So, uh, well, uh, I thank you for your patience. Uh, feel free to, uh, uh, we call it, uh, give me any. Uh, uh, questions, comments, criticisms, or accommodations on how uh, the meeting went. Uh, I'll try to put up a uh, a uh, subject uh, there at the uh, on the Yahoo group, and uh, you can uh, make your comments uh, and whatnot there. And uh, I guess uh, meeting adjourned. Uh, uh, actually, hold on. Let's see. Yep, yep. It's not that pretty. Yeah. So Paul just wanted to also bring up that the uh, red cat uh, uh, focusing is not that hard. Uh, uh, with that because of that book link but uh, uh before uh one more thing before uh, we leave uh steve you said that you were able to record this uh steve christensen oh god um uh, here you're muted uh looks doesn't look very positive to me <laughs> uh
Come on, unmute. Okay, yeah. Were you able to? Okay. Okay, very good. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. And uh, uh, actually, I'm going to run out to my scope across the street at my in-laws place and get some more oxygen three from that uh, rosette and uh, cone nebulae. So, yes, good night. And don't stop looking up. <laughs> Quite literally as far as the state of things right now. And, uh, well, we're amateurs. So, yeah, look up at the sky.